a brief of the Ten Commandments. Have thou no other gods but me, unto no image bow thy knee. Take not the name of God in vain, nor Sabbath day do thou profane. Honor thy father and mother too, and see that thou no murder do. From whoredom keep thee pure and clean, and steal not though thy state be mean. See that thou no false witness bear, and covet not thy neighbor's gear. O Lord, our souls to thee convert, and write thy laws into our heart. Hello and welcome everybody to a new video from Jörg from Juggler 66, Hour of the Truth. Today is the 24th of December 2017 and I had a little present in my email this morning when I opened it, when I started my computer after getting up. And that was an email notification from YouTube that one of my videos has been flagged as being not fitting to the YouTube community. You probably know these um, messages that YouTube can send out because the, your videos uh, stir up hatred or hate speech or violence or whatever. Uh, well, I never do a video that does this because I'm a Bible-believing Christian and I am against violence. But the point is that um, the very first chapter of the book Reading Behind the Dictators that I did in 2016, or at least I uploaded it in 2016, um, the very first chapter called Jesuit Jews and Freemasons has now been flagged. And by that it is um, taken away from the official YouTube list, means you can still watch it, but you get a notification of if you really want to proceed to watch this, because this video is not in agreement with the YouTube community, as they say. Um, and you cannot vote a thumbs up or a thumbs down, you, can all leave comment, uh, you cannot leave comments or anything on that video, and it has been published in, uh, somewhere in September 2016, and today is the 24th of December 2017, so we're speaking about, about 15 months that that video has been online, and now one or another YouTube troll flagged that video, and therefore it is not easy to find anymore. Why am I starting this session of the book reading of Against the Roman Papacy and Institution of the Devil with this notification? Well, first and for all, because it happened just today, and second for all, because I want to uh, remind you that when you like videos that you see on YouTube, whether they are mine or they are from anybody else, and they deal with the same subjects that my videos do, because uh, when you when you upload some, uh, when you watch uh, and like something from Lady Gaga and all that stuff, you don't need to copy that. But when you want to make sure that those videos maybe contain some truth, and you want to make sure that they will be preserved for <laughs> even later generations, maybe download them from the computer, download them from the internet. Uh, this video, Jesuit Jews and Freemason, Chapter 1 of Behind the Dictators, from uh, Leo Herbert Lehman, is still available, but only when you have the link. It is not in the advised videos anymore, uh, and it is always uh, accompanied by this banner, uh, if you really want to proceed. And there are a lot of people who, yeah... Uh, don't want to proceed, then they will say, oh no, I'm not going to watch that, and they don't even have any idea what's that all about. So, and this is just a video of a book reading, people. This book is still available on the internet as a PDF. You can freely get that, and, and that is no hate speech. But it's the truth. It's the truth about the dictators. It's the truth about our society that is being led by the Jesuits. And our society that is part of the Antichrist kingdom, whether we like it or not, we live in the flesh in this world, and we live in the Antichrist kingdom. And this is another example of censorship, I would like to call it. Now I'm dealing here with a book against the Roman papacy and institution of the devil. And it is very much possible that any time also these videos are being flagged, or even my whole channel is being flagged because I speak of the truth that the uh, the world doesn't want to know, and um, that all these messages are gone if you don't copy them out of the internet when you watch them 
and don't copy them and don't download them so that you can preserve them on an extra USB stick, on an extra uh, hard disk or whatever medium you have in your own hands. Yeah? Don't use the cloud that's uh, in the internet, and nothing is from you what's in there. But uh, so that you can you can download these videos and make sure that you can preserve them and then that you can watch them later also and maybe even teach other people about uh, the things that I or anybody else speaks about in these kind of videos. So when you are a fan of uh, Inquisition Update, Tom Press, it's the same. I would download all that stuff or at least have access to the archives of uh, First Amendment Radio and when, when you get the access to the First Amendment Radio then uh, you should maybe, uh, maybe make your own archive of at least a part of these readings of these things that Tom Press does there because that's the same thing. Today it's my channel, tomorrow it's another and maybe the day after that it's your own. But when you wait until it is your own before you take any measures then it's gonna be too late. Anyway, I've come here Today to do the next reading, I think this is the, I don't know, which number are we? 16, I think. Uh, this is the 16th reading of the book uh, Against the Roman Papacy and Institution of the Devil. And I want to finish today the very first part of the book. <laughs> There's not so many, there are not so many pages left anymore because it has, th uh, it stops on page 376 and we are already on page 353, but um, we are still dealing with the first part. When we retreat to page 289, it says that Martin Luther said that he wanted to cover three things. First, whether it is true that the Pope in Rome is the head of Christendom, that he is above councils, emperors and angels. That is the first point uh, that Martin Luther wants to attack. He has done so, um, as we, of course, followed the last about ten parts of this reading, very successfully and proved to us that the Bible never ever even gives any authorization to the Pope when he claims that he is above the church and above the councils and above the emperors and above the uh, uh, and above the angels of course um, he is not the head of quote unquote Christendom the Pope can never be the head of Christendom because the Roman Catholic Church is not Christianity. The Roman Catholic Church is not Christian. It seems so on the outward. That's why there are so many people still going and visiting Roman Catholic churches. It's on the outside. But when you look at the inside, you know that it is not that way. And that reminds me of what Jesus said. In the Bible it is recorded in Matthew chapter 23 verse 27 that Jesus said, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites! For ye are like unto white sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. This is how our Lord spoke in the time that he was walking the earth concerning or addressing the Pharisees. Woe unto you scribes and Pharisees, the scribes and Pharisees. So who are the scribes and Pharisees of the 21st century? Or of the modern time anyway? Right, the hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church. So Martin Luther proved to us that the scribes and Pharisees Jesus spoke about in Matthew 24, uh, 23 verse 27 is the Roman Catholic Church. He just uses other words. He doesn't even cite this one, but that doesn't matter. Martin Luther is in total agreement with what I say here. So we're going to go continue now and uh, bring this little point, well, this little point, <laughs> bring this point to, a, to an ending today because that ends on page 359 and I want to get the reading done today because there are so many other readings wa waiting to do and as you see when people flag my videos the time is running out. I don't know how much time I do have anymore so I have to publish my stuff um, quite fast. So, uh, we start on the second paragraph on page 353, where Martin Luther continues, Moreover, he says, 
because one should do such great service free, yeah, service for the church. As he says in Matthew 10, verse 8, quote, You received without pay, give without pay. This is what he speaks to the real church, of course. One should not seek profit. One should not seek honor, sensual pleasure, and power on earth the preaching, uh, through the preaching office. We have a rich reward in heaven. Um, that's why on another place in the Bible it says, uh, wherever your heart is, there is your treasure also, right? And our, I, I think that is in Matthew 6, if I'm not mistaken. And our treasure should be in heaven, not in this earth, where it is corrupted anyway. But of course, Christians should also, without, char without charge, nourish and honor their shepherds for Christ's sake. As he himself said, in Matthew 10, verse 10, quote, Eat and drink whatever there is, for the, de for the laborer deserves his food. And as in 1 Corinthians 9, verse 14, it says, quote, The Lord commanded that those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. Unquote. Not as though they were selling and the Christians buying the gospel from them, but rather both should do it for nothing, and for Christ's sake. These preach, and those feed. The treasure is too great. It cannot tolerate the buying and bargaining necessary in worldly affairs. A very important point that we have to stand still here by. And of course, the modern churches uh, misuse, abuse terms like those I've just read, to ask for ties. And I don't think that there's anything wrong with ties. I think there's something wrong with tithing a corrupt church. And as all the churches of today have become corrupt, ties over all, uh, 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 over all the main, I want to say, that's Flemish, <laughs> in generally are uh, not a good thing anymore. Because there are no true churches out there. And true preachers, like me and other people who do exactly the same as I do, have a very hard life in this world, have it very difficult to pay their bills and to get their head above water in this world because financially it is not easy. And because, of course, we don't sell the word of God. I would never ask money for the things that I'm doing here because I'm doing this being led by the Holy Spirit. And the moment that I ask money for it, I'm quite sure the Holy Spirit would retract from me. I would not have been in the right spirit anyway from the beginning. I even go that far to say. Yeah? But if somebody out there has it in their heart to support people like me, financially or however, they can do that. And I have a lot of German-speaking brethren who support me. There are a few who put money together that I could uh, get a new computer that is coming next week, uh, probably. And people who support me in that way. And uh, I'm very, very thankful for that because we live in a system that makes it very difficult for people like me to survive and in the meantime also have time to spread the truth. These preach and those feed. Yeah, the treasure is too great. It cannot tolerate the buying and bargaining necessary in worldly affairs. Therefore, we need the support of the people. And that is something else but tithing. Churches who have become a posted. Think about that, that when you want to give your money, to whom you give it. Martin Luther continues, and what is more, not only should the shepherds tend gratuitously, but they should also expect the prophet's reward for it, as the Lord tells Peter as an example to all others. Quote, Peter, if you love me, tend my sheep. The reward you should expect here on earth shall be this. You girded yourself and walked when you would. But when you are old, another will gird you, and carry you where you do not want to go. Unquote. We can read that in the 21st or last chapter of the Apostle John, in the, um, in the Epistle of John, verses 17 through 18. See, dear brother Martin Luther continues, 
What is to tend Christ's sheep? To serve and preach the gospel freely, and to expect for it to be girded and carried, that is, to hazard and wager body, wife, child, goods, and everything. Who would do this unless he loved Christ and did it for Christ's sake? A miser, an inordinately ambitious man, or a paunch knave would undoubtedly leave it alone. This is how the apostles and the prophets tended, as well as the holy bishops of the Roman Church, Fabian, Cornelius, Sixtus and their like. So we are speaking here in a little footnote about the Roman bishops who were martyred during the persecution under the Roman Emperor. We are speaking of people of the quote-unquote original church, yeah, bishops who were in the Roman church in that time, but who were standing for the true gospel. That was before the total corruption of the early church. We are speaking about um, people who were martyred during the persecution under Decius, in 250 to 251 and thereafter. Fabian in 250, Cornelius I in 253 and Sixtus II in 258. These Fabian, Cornelius, Sixtus and the like, um, as Martin Luther counts them here, have shed their blood for it and became martyrs. Martyrs in the biblical sense. Yeah? because they were killed for their conviction of spreading the unbridled gospel, the true gospel of Jesus Christ. This is also how we praise Chanel. For the Pope and his gang have girded and carried away, uh, carried many of us in the, 25, uh, in, in the 20 years to fire, water, sword, dungeons, into exile, from house and home, wife and family, solely because of the pastoring and the gospel. And they have not stopped yet. You have to understand, when Martin Luther writes this book in 1545, he himself lives under the church ban, under condemnation, under anathema. He is excommunicated already since 1521. Or 1520, yeah. I just forget when he when he burned his bull. Um, so he's about 25 years living under the ban. For the Pope and his gang have girded and carried many of us, Bible-believing Protestants, people who proclaim the Bible and the Bible alone, in these 20 years, or more than 20 years, to fire, water, sword, dungeons, into exile from house and home, wife and family, solely because of the pastoring and the gospel. And they have not stopped yet. He mentions here the Inquisition. The Inquisition that ran between the 13th and the 19th century. And in some places even up until the 20th century, when we are speaking of Spain. Now, this is what Martin Luther addresses here. For the Pope and his gang have girded and carried many of us in these twenty years to fire, water, sword, dungeons, exile from house and home. The Inquisition, the persecution of the saints was hard at those times. And just to name one of whom Michael, uh, of whom Michael, of whom Martin Luther speaks here, is, for example, William Tyndale. He was executed and burned at the stake in 1536. Exact one of the examples that Martin Luther speaks here about. They have condemned us to death long ago. Well, that's what Martin Luther received with the ban from the Pope, with the excommunication. Because by that he was set, um, we say in, in German we have the expression Vogelfrei, meaning free as a bird, which you in English al uh, almost al always understand under the word outlaw. He has been outlawed by the ban, by the excommunication, all these years. And by that, of course, always had to make sure that the people from the Pope could not get him. Okay? 
They have condemned us to death long ago, just because of this pastoring. They are anxiously hoping for the hour, if God would permit it just once, when they, as they have often strongly attempted, will be able to gird and carry us all, including our princes with lands and people, schools and churches, in such a way that one could sweep up after us with a feather duster. What Martin Luther speaks about here, my dear brethren, is exactly what happened when the Jesuit order rose to power in Europe and in the New World United States of America. That's what's happening ever since the Jesuit order really came to power. That including the princes, the lands, the people, the schools, the churches are being swept away in a way like with a feather duster. We shall just have to accept this danger and see, no, and accept their bitter, venomous, devilish wrath, their gnashing of teeth and their flashing of knives. If we are doing this for money or goods, for honor or sensual pleasures, then we are the most senseless people upon whom the sun has shone for over five thousand and five hundred years, that is, since the beginning of the world. That is a very strong expression Martin Luther says here. He says, if we are doing this for money, if we are going to preach God's word in exchange for money, or goods, for honor, or sensual pleasures, then we are the most senseless people upon whom the sun has shone for over 5,500 years, that is, since the beginning of the world. Yeah, there follows a little footnote here. Uh, 189 says, see page 65, note 190. So I'm just going into there, page 65, and then footnote, what does it say here, 190, and there it says that Luther's view is based upon the idea that the world would last for 6,000 years. <laughs> is that only Luther's idea, or is that every Bible-believing Protestant's idea too? Of which only a few years were left at his time. He seems to have arrived at the number 1400 for, uh, on the basis of his estimate for the beginning of the Easter controversies in 190 and until 1539. And there you can look that up in another encyclopedia where he got his views from. But that the world today in the year 2000 is about 6,000 years old, I think that is already long accepted quote-unquote knowledge, or better said belief, of all the Christians out there. Of all the real, true, Bible-believing Christians. But that Jesus comes back exact at the end of 6,000 years, I am not so sure about because when you listen closely to the parable of the Samaritan in the Gospels, then you will understand that he pays the, um, the man in the inn to, to serve for the wounded person for at least two days and pays him uh, two, um, two coins uh, for, 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 for the two days, uh, two days, two thousand years, and he says that uh, when I tarry, I will pay you when I come back. So, to me, it is not even absolutely sure that Jesus Christ will return just after these 2,000 years. He may tarry. He announced it in the parable of the, of the, fa of the, uh, of the Samaritan, of the good Samaritan. But in the meantime, you know, we have the assurance of our salvation and whether I am alive in this Antichrist world when our Lord comes back, or I am already dead, I will never miss it, because I will be at the first resurrection. That is my hope, and that is my faith. Anyway, Martin Luther continues, If only emperors and kings would once be Christians, and do a service to the Lord Christ, which they certainly owe him, and make sure that the Pope would have to be a bishop of the Roman Church, like those before the papacy were, who were not popes, but 
true bishops, as was mentioned above, and make him really fulfill the passage, quote, tend my sheep and build my church on the rock, namely, pasture and build. Because he almost demands and claims this, he should thereupon expect the storms of hell's gate, or the girding and carrying where he does not want to go. And so that he would not be overburdened at the beginning, it would be enough for him to take over his foremost parish church in Rome, St. John Lateran. And here we go into another footnote that reads that uh, San Giovanni in Laterno had been praised as the quote-unquote mother church ever since the time of Constantine the Great, who had given the palace of the Laterani family to Bishop Sylvester. This palace was turned into a church, so what we call today the Vatican is actually built on the church of St. John the Lateran. Okay? And there begin to pasture, or in any case keep a shepherd there for himself, and attempt to tend the sheep of Christ which are there, and expect to be girded. Now, what is the use? He would not want to tend a single soul for a single hour. He who now wants to tend the whole world, and curses all who do not want to let themselves be tended, even though the world is crying and calling for such shepherds who can pasture. And the Lord Christ himself complains that he is lacking such shepherds. Quote, the harvest is plentiful, he says, but the laborers are few. Pray therefore the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Unquote. Matthew chapter 9 verses 37 and 38. Indeed, the whole world stands open, if only someone would want to pasture it, as St. Paul says in 1 Timothy 3, verse 1, quote, If one aspires to the office of bishop, he desires a noble task. One must not compel, run after, and look for, I mean, the Christians who would like to be saved, such shepherds, and one cannot find enough of them. For the burghers and peasants, burghers means uh, the laymen, the civil servants we say today, <laughs> the burghers and peasants to say now, quote, Why should I let my son go on with his studies? He will be a beggar if he becomes a parson. I would rather let him learn a trade or become a merchant. Well then, if churches and schools too become barren of God's word, then those who, ga who, have, who have given the cause for such desolation, be it through the left, uh, through the t sorry, <laughs> be it through the theft of church goods or the keeping away of children from the schools, or however they hinder or help to hinder, they will have to assume the responsibility here and at the last judgment. God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit testify that pasturing the sheep was his darkest work, of for which the Son became man and shed his blood, so that the people should be saved. He who does this work, or helps it, which cannot happen without schools and churches, shall be a great saint in heaven, with the patriarchs, prophets, apostles, martyrs, and all the saints. Does this mean nothing to you? And have you neither hope nor faith for it? Then may God grant you that you become a Pope, a Cardinal or member of the Roman See, thus getting what you deserve. Well, says the Pope, I don't understand the pastoring that way. Dear little virgin Pope, how do you understand it then? This way. I thought that I would terrify all the kings and the whole world in St. Peter's name, so that they would submit themselves to be pastured under me and serve me, and I would thus become sovereign of the world, and in that way I could rebuild the old Roman Empire in Rome, mightier and greater than it was at the time of Augustus and Tiberius. 
<laughs> and I would be called the true Roman Emperor, Lord of Lords, King of Kings, as we can read in Revelation 19, verse 16, as my prophets told me. Unquote. Of the statement of the Pope, how does you, little virgin Pope, how do you understand then pastoring? In what way do you understand it? Now we've just understood that the Pope actually says, I understand pastoring in the biblical sense this way. I thought I would terrify all the kings and the whole world on St. Peter's name so that they would submit themselves to be pastured unto me, uh, under me and serve me and I would thus become sovereign of the world and in that way I could rebuild the old Roman Empire in Rome mightier and greater than it was at the time of Augustus or Tiberius. August, Augustus lived between 30 BC and 14 AD and Tiberius between 14 and 37 AD. Okay? And the Pope wants to make the Roman Empire in Rome mightier and greater than it was at the time of Augustus Tiberius. Now, what do we have here when we understand correctly what Martin Luther writes here in a quote-unquote conversation, which of course had never taken place, but where he wants to make sure that we understand the way the Pope thinks about pastoring. We have here the Pope actually saying that he will be the head of the new world order. Yeah? Where does the Pope say that, Jörg? <sighs> Martin Luther writes it here. I would terrify all the kings and the whole world in St. Peter's name, so that they would submit themselves to be pastured under me and serve me, and I would thus become sovereign of the world. I am the sovereign of the world, in a way that I could rebuild the Roman Empire in Rome mightier and greater than it was at the time of Augustus and Tiberius. Now, what is mightier as in the time of mightier as in the time of Augustus and or Tiberius, when you have not only the known world at that time, but when you have the whole world under your power, under your control, when you have all the kings and all the princes? terrified and under control as he says here today and how does he achieve that well with the Jesuit order that infiltrates every government of this earth and they all tremble in fear of the Pope and they all listen to the Pope and by that we can have a look at the new book when it is finally published from P.D. Stewart Pope Francis Lord of the World that book title says everything that Martin Luther speaks about here almost 500 years ago. The new world order is not new and is not a new idea, but the old world order is the old world order restored. The time when the Pope had the power above every king and prince in Europe, in the known western world, in that time when the Pope had the power and they were trembling because of him and they feared him, because he ruled them in quote-unquote St. Peter's name, that power he wants to have back, and that is nothing else but the quote-unquote new world order, on a global scale. And you know all this fear, but yeah, well, they will kill so many people. Yeah, of course, Zbigny, Zbigny Brzezinski said it already. It is, in, in so many years ago, it was easier to control a million people than to kill a million people. Well, today it is much easier to kill a million people, but to control a million people. So when they get rid of the resistance, they have their control. They can never control seven or eight billion people on the earth, as we have right now. And they know that. So therefore, these people have to go. They have to come, there has to come a persecution in the way the world has never seen before getting rid of all the people who are not controllable. Huh? And whether they do that via bioweapons or atomic weapons or what, I, I don't know and I don't care. 
I don't fear the one who can kill my flesh in the earth. I, kill, I fear the one who can kill the flesh and the soul in, in, in heaven, uh, in, in hell. Yeah? Who can erase my eternal life. Him I fear. I don't fear Satan and his minions here on earth who strive for their new world order, as Martin Luther writes already here in 1545 about. And that the Pope wants to be called the true Roman Emperor. He wants to be called Lord of Lords, King of Kings. Well, that is a title of those are titles that are only for Jesus Christ, for the real true Son of God, not for the quote-unquote Vicar of Christ, the quote-unquote Vicarius Filii Dei, who is only the placeholder of Satan on earth. Martin Luther makes it more and more obvious with the reading and understanding of this book against the Roman papacy and institution of the devil that the Pope is nothing else but a puppet who wears the mask of a man and behind that mask is Satan himself. We are involved in a spiritual battle. And um, today is uh, Sunday, the 24th. Uh, yesterday... I had a Bible study with uh, Tom Fress and um, and uh, my brother, my wonderful brother in Christ, Brett Norman, also, and we were reading through um, uh, Ephesians yesterday, the last chapters, and in Ephesians, uh, in the last chapter, I just opened that here, that I can read it to you. Uh, was it there or was it in the in the first chapter of Philippians? Where did I cross that on? I don't know. Uh, put on the whole armor of God. We were speaking about that. I think that is um, uh, yeah, that is in Ephesians chapter 6 verse 13. If we want to stand against the Pope, if we want to stand against the powers that we are fighting, huh? because it says in verse 12 in Ephesians chapter 6, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So, my dear brethren, Surely over there in the United States of America, who are so fond of the Second Amendment, the right to bear arms, we are not in a fleshly war. We are not in a physical war. We wrestle against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness in this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. What are these these high places? Well, spiritual wickedness in the hierarchy of the churches, in the hierarchy of the politics, and everywhere else. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, so you don't need a gun. No handgun, nor big gun, nor, nor knife, nor sword, no nothing. But, it continues in verse 13, Wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Now, the point is that we are soldiers of Christ, like, quote-unquote, the Jesuits are soldiers of the Christ on earth, of the vicar of Christ, who is actually the vicar of Satan. We are soldiers. Jesus Christ said it himself. My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom was of this world, my people would fight. But my kingdom is not from hence. But we are his soldiers. Therefore, we have to take the whole armor of God. Now, what is the whole armor of God? It continues and then you will understand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth and having the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shot with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with the prayer and supplication in the Spirit, 
and watching thereunto with all uh, perseverance and supplication for all saints. You know, a lot of people always cite Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, and also verse 13, wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God, but there are very few people out there who read on and understand what the whole armor of God is. So I'm going to read it explaining, explainingly to you another time. What is the armor of God? We have seven points that make up the full armor of God. First of all it says, and your feet shot, uh, uh, stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth. So point one of the whole armor of God is truth. And having on the breastplate of righteousness. Number two, righteousness is another armor of God. And your feet shot with the preparation of the gospel of peace. 3. The gospel of peace. The gospel of the New Testament. That is another armor of God. Above all, taking the shield of faith. Number 4. Faith is another armor of God that we should have. Wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation. Point 5. Salvation is another armor of God, because the salvation of the Lord is true. The salvation of the Lord is never in question. The salvation of the Roman Catholic Church is in question, because there you are never sure of your salvation. But when you follow Jesus Christ to the letter, when you are a disciple of Jesus Christ, and you follow the Bible, and you keep His commandments, as He said, who loves me keeps my commandments, then you are a true Bible believer and then you are sure of your salvation. The helmet of salvation is the next point. And this, uh, the sixth point is, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, the Bible. And the Bible alone, when you hold up the Bible and the devil comes to you, he flees because he has nothing to bring in against the true Word of God. And praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Those are the seven points. Yeah? We have the truth, the righteousness, the gospel of peace. We have um, the faith, salvation, and the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and praying. Those seven points are the whole armor of God. And those seven points, those whole armor of God, is what we should put on. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. How more wicked can it get? that when Martin Luther has this little conversation here with the Pope, when he says, I don't understand the pastoring that way, well, dear little virgin Pope, how do you understand it then? This way. I thought that I would terrify all the kings and the whole world in St. Peter's name, so that they would submit themselves to be pastured under me and serve me, and I would thus become sovereign of the world, and in that way I could rebuild the Roman Empire in Rome, mightier and greater than it was at the time of Augustus or Tiberius, and I would be called the true Roman Emperor, Lord of Lords, King of Kings, as in Revelation 19, verse 16, as my prophets told me. Yeah. This is the war that we are into. This is the spiritual war that we are into, and therefore we have to arm ourselves with the whole armor of God, all seven weapons. Those are the weapons that we should pick up. Read them again, Ephesians chapter 6. I continue in the book of Martin Luther. Yes, yes, little virgin Pope, if you are torn there, then let the devil and his mother patch you. But are you not afraid of God that he will sink you with lightning and thunder from heaven through the earth into the abyss of hell for such abominable forgery and blasphemy of his word? 
<laughs> Your health, Mr. Sow. Do you drunken German fools think we are idiots like you and will believe in such gasps of buffoonery about God and your dead Christ? Oh, then why do you use his words about the rock, keys and pasturing? Oh, dear one, replies the Pope, oh, dear one, it is better to govern beasts than to be governed by beasts. Don't you know? To catch a titmouse, you must blow a titmouse whistle. And to catch a Christian, you must learn to talk like a Christian. That is why, simple Christian, that is one expression that he always uses against the Germans, bon Christian, that is why, simple Christian, we, the Roman Catholic hierarchy, must grasp you by your faith, and with this we can hold and lead you German beasts wherever and however we want, like one leads bears by their nose ring, so that you don't get too big for our britches and play with us, as your ancestors, the Goths and the Lombards, and some emperors have done. Thank you very much, my lord ass, for the excellent information, most hellish Pope. This is quite an intriguing little conversation that Martin Luther has here with the Pope, don't you think? Everything that he says here is based on scripture and on history. The Germans over won Rome again and again and again in the, in the first centuries after Christ. And even the Roman Emperor fell to the power of the Goths. And the Goths eventually are the Alemanni, are the Germans, who later became then Roman Catholic most of the time, but who were persecuting Rome. The Goths and the Lombards, as says here. Well then, if I were Emperor, I know well what I would do. I would link and gird all the blasphemous scoundrels together, popes, cardinals, and the whole papal riffraff, and lead them no farther than three miles out of Rome toward Ostia, for they would not go ungirded and unled where they did not want to go. There is a small body of water called in Latin Mare Tyrrhenium, so that's part of the, uh, of, the, uh, of, of the Mediterranean Sea, a wonderful spa against all the infections, damages and weaknesses of papal holiness, of all cardinals and of all his holy see, in which I would carefully set them and bathe them. And if they were frightened of the water, since usually possessed and insane people fear water, I would give them, for safety, the ruck upon which they and their church are built, and the keys which with they can bind and lose everything in heaven and on earth, so that they could command the water as much as they wished. They should also have um, they should also have the shepherd's crook and clubs, so that they could beat the face of the water until its mouth and nose bleed. Finally, they should also have this pasture along for a tonic and pleasure drink, all the decrees, decretals, sexti, clementi, extravagantes, bulls, indulgences, uh, and butter, cheese, and milk letters hung around their necks, so that they would be quite safe. What will you bet? If they had bath one half hour in these baths, all their infections, afflictions, and infirmities would be over and done with. I would vouch for this and give my Lord Christ as a pledge. Meanwhile, this book has grown too large under my hand, Martin Luther says, and as one says, age is forgetful and talkative. Perhaps this is what happened to me. Although the papacy's diabolical horror is itself an unspeakable disorder, I have nevertheless, I hope, to whoever is willing to be told, for I am sure of it for myself, so clearly and powerfully developed my first point, which I took up 
above whether the Pope is head of Christendom, lord over emperors, kings and all of the world, that praise God, not one good Christian conscience can believe anything, but that the Pope is not and cannot be the head of the Christian church and cannot be God's or Christ's vicar. Instead, he is the head of the accursed church, of all the worst scoundrels on earth, a vicar of the devil, an enemy of God, an adversary of Christ, a destroyer of Christ's real churches, a teacher of lies, blasphemies and idolatries, an arch-church thief and church robber of the keys and all the goods of both the church and the temporal lords, a murderer of kings, and inciter of all kinds of bloodshed, a brothel keeper over all brothel keepers, and all vermin, even that which cannot be named, an antichrist, a man of sin, and child of perdition, as we can read in Second Thessalonians 2 verse 3, a true werewolf. Whoever does not want to believe this may keep on riding with, this, with his God, the Pope. I, a qualified teacher and preacher in the Church of Christ, responsible for telling the truth, have herewith done my share. He who wants to stink may stink. He who wants to be lost may be lost. His blood is on his own head. We know that in Christendom it has been so arranged that all churches are equal, and there is only one single church of Christ in the world as we pray, quote, I believe in one holy Christian church, unquote. The reason is this. Whether there is a church anywhere in the whole world, it still has no other gospel and scripture, no other baptism or communion, no other faith and spirit, no other Christ and God, no other Lord's prayer and prayer, no other hope and eternal life than we have here in our church in Wittenberg. And their bishops are equal to our bishops, are equal to our pastors or preachers, none is Lord or servant of the other. They all have the same mind and heart, and everything belongs to the church, uh, and everything belongs to the church is equal, except that, as First, uh, first Corinthians 12 and um, 4 through 11 it says here, and Romans 12 verse 3 say, a preacher or a Christian can have a stronger faith, other or more gifts than another. For example. One can interpret scripture better, this one govern better, that one preach better, this one cast out spirits better, another console better, one no more languages, and so on. Every has its own gift. But such gifts do not make for inequality or lordship in the church. Indeed, they certainly do not make a Christian as we can read in Matthew chapter 7, verses 22 and 23, for one must first be a Christian. But the papal ass wants to be lord of the church, although he is not even a Christian. But the papal ass wants to be lord of the church, although he is not even a Christian, believes nothing, and can no longer do anything but fart like an ass. Here is St. Peter himself, who is an apostle, not the Pope's Peter, who is hellish devil under St. Peter's name, like the Pope's Christ is the devil's mother under Christ's name, but the true holy St. Peter, who writes in his epistle to his bishops in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, in 1 Peter 5, verses 1 and 2, quote, I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ as well as a partaker in the glory that is to be revealed. Tend the flock of God, that is your charge, etc. Look at that. Peter calls himself a fellow elder, that is, equal with pastor or preacher. 
He does not want to rule over them, but want to be equal with them, although he knows that he is an apostle. The office of preacher or bishop is the highest office which was held by God's Son himself, as well as by all the apostles, prophets and patriarchs. God's word and faith is above everything, above all gifts and personal worth. The word elder, in Greek presbyter, and there comes the presbyter church from, is in one case a word for old age, as one says, an old man. But here it is a name for an office, because one took old and experienced people for the office. Now, we can call it pastor and preacher or minister. This ends part one. And with part two on page 359 of the book, I will continue next time. But I want to read this very last paragraph once again, because I think this is very important for our understanding, that we see the difference of what the Pope preaches and what Peter actually has done. Because this is this last part all about. Here, St. Peter himself, Martin Luther says, who is an apostle, not the Pope's Peter, who is the hellish devil under St. Peter's name, like the Pope's Christ is the devil's mother under Christ's name, yeah? because the Jesus Christ of the Roman Catholic Church is not the Jesus Christ of the Bible, but the true holy St. Peter. Yeah? So here, St. Peter himself, who is an apostle, but the true Holy Saint Peter who writes in his epistle to his bishops in Pontus, in Galatia, in Cappadocia, in Asia, in Bithynia, among others in 1 Peter chapter 5 verses 1 and 2, quote, I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ as well as a partaker in the glory that is to be revealed. Tend the flock of God, that is your charge. Unquote. Look at that. Peter calls himself a fellow elder. Does the Pope call himself a fellow Christian with all the lay people? No, because he builds on the hierarchy of priests and deacons and bishops and cardinals and the Pope on top. He is not an equal, he is a superior. But look at Peter. Peter calls himself a fellow elder that is equal with every pastor or preacher. He does not want to rule over them, but wants to be equal with them, although he knows that he is an apostle. That doesn't make him any better, that doesn't put him in any hierarchy. The office of preacher or bishop is the highest office which was held by God's Son himself, Jesus Christ, as well as by all the apostles, prophets and patriarchs. God's word and faith is above everything. God's word is above all gifts and personal worth. The word elder is in one case a word for old age, as one says, an old man. But here it is a name for an office because one took old and experienced people for the office. Now we can call it pastor and preacher or minister. Martin Luther ends this part one. With the 17th reading of this book I will continue next time and I hope that you enjoyed it and that you study Ephesians chapter 6 with the full armor of God and that you know, whether you live in the United States of America or wherever you live, that the, our weapons are not carnal weapons. Our weapons are spiritual. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but we wrestle against principalities, powers, the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore take you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with point one, truth, and having on the breastplate of point two, righteousness, and your feet shut with the preparation of the three, gospel of peace. Above all, 
taking the, number four, shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And take on, number five, the helmet of salvation, and number six, the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and number seven, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Those are my closing words on the 16th reading of the book of Martin Luther, the um, of from 1545 against the Roman papacy and institution of the devil. Until next time, Jörg from Joggler 66, Hour of the Truth, signing off, says God bless you and bye bye.